Okay, welcome back everyone uh, to the second session. I uh, hope we, you had a good break and managed to catch up on the social tables with, with other folks. Um, so in the second session, um, the focus will be on premier papers in recent conferences from India. Uh, so in this, the four speakers will be talking about uh, relevant research papers which appeared in top 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 tier conferences and we have tried to keep uh, these diverse given the breadth of the data science topics so hope you will like it so first of all i mean as our first speaker in this session we are very pleased to have kalika bali kalika is a principal researcher at microsoft research india uh, working in the areas of machine learning natural language systems and applications as well as technology for emerging markets her research interests lie broadly in the area of speech and language technology especially in the use of linguistic models for building technology that offers a more natural human computer as well as computer mediated interactions and technology for low resource languages. She is a linguist by training and technologist by profession and believes that local language technology, especially with speech interfaces, can help millions of people gain entry into a world that is still now almost inaccessible to them. So welcome Kalika, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Sharia. Uh, so I'm going to now um, um, share my slides um, and hopefully everyone can see that. OK, so I'm going to today talk about uh, uh, our paper, The State and Fate of Linguistic Diversity in the NLP World, uh, which was uh, based on the work done by Pratik Joshi, Sebastian Santi, Amar Buddhi Raja, uh, and uh, me and um, Monoji Chaudhary, who are researchers um, in uh, Microsoft Research Labs. This paper was uh, part of ACL 2020 theme track, where uh, you know ACL was trying to uh, talk about taking stock of where the community is and where it is going. So um, what does this mean, state and fate of linguistic diversity in the NLP world? So we'll start with you know, taking um, an example of two uh, very diverse languages. So one is Dutch and one is Somali. So both of them have a fairly large number of speakers. Uh, Dutch has 29 um, million speakers. Somali has 18 million speakers. Uh, but if you look at the resources that are available in, say, Linguistic Data Consortium, LDC, and LRA map, you'll find that um, Dutch is considerably higher resource than Somali. Right? And if you look at like the kind of technologies that are available for Dutch, you'll find that you know Dutch has state-of-the-art uh, systems, whereas um, you know Somali has very few, very um, low-grade translation systems available. Now, to uh, exemplify this, um, we look at this example: uh, the tiger moved across the grass. Right? Um, now, if we take a you know off the shelf commercial well known uh, translation system and do a dutch translation of it uh, using the english to dutch uh, translation system and then we um, take it back we find that um, you know we get the same thing back so you know english to dutch dutch to english and we are at the same thing but if we do the same with somali we find that we get actually a very weird translation back to English. So obviously, something here is not um, functioning right. If we also look at um, you know, the, the papers, et cetera, that are focused in uh, various conferences on uh, these two languages, we find that there is a big disparity uh, between the languages. right? Now, what is this disparity between languages, and how can we quantify it, and how can we understand it? So we uh, looked at it, uh, and we tried to answer you know five questions about how has the fate of different languages changed with current language technologies and what role do, do various um, parts of various components of um, NLP, whether it's um, systems, whether it's uh, um, resources, whether it's uh, you know conferences and individual researchers, what role do they have to play in this whole thing? So the five questions that we are trying to answer here is how many resources are available across the world's languages and how do they correlate with the number of speakers? You know, so, um, you know, uh, we do know this um, even if anecdotally, even if not in a very you know rigorous quantitative manner, that uh, the number of resources available for a particular language have very little to do 
with um, the number of people who speak those languages. The second thing we wanted to look at is which typological features have these NLP systems been exposed to, right? And which features are uh, underrepresented. So um, understand this as like now we have huge, massively multilingual systems. And, um, you know, um, are these systems actually exposed uh, to, uh, you know, language specific or typological features from different languages? And um, if not, then which are the features which are not uh, uh, represented there and how does this affect technology building for those languages the third is how inclusive has ACL been in conducting and publishing research for different languages and ACL being a top tier um, NLP conference is uh, you know representative of all the top tier um, NLP conferences like how how do these top tier NLP conferences view um, research and how do they publish research which actually deals with different languages um, then does the resource availability influence the research questions and uh, publication venue so if you have less resource uh, resources available the kind of work that you do might be very different and does that mean that you will not publish this in say ACL but at some other venue and then obviously what can we as uh, individual researchers or the community on the whole do to kind of bridge this uh, resource divide so how did we go about doing this we kind of the first thing that we did was we built a language um, taxonomy based on uh, two very simple features so on the <clears throat> sorry on the x axis here you're looking at excuse me you're looking at <clears throat> Wiki, uh, Wikipedia pages and on the y axis you're looking at label data that is available for languages um, um, based on what is there in the LDC catalog or the LRA map right and the reason why we are taking this unlabeled Wikipedia uh, pages uh, is because most of the current um, um, language models use these uh, data sources Wikipedia pages to train uh, their models right so based on this kind of a, a setup we came up with five different um, categories of languages or five different classes of languages so uh, class zero uh, is the left behind so these are the languages um, like gondi mundari etc which have absolutely um, negligible presence like they had no resources available uh, no uh, systems available for these languages and then on the other uh, end of the uh, spectrum we have the winners which is languages like english and french and we have like, like um, a range in between right so class one is the people who are scraping by class two is hopeful so on and so forth so based on these features we kind of uh, classify these languages um, into these classes now if you look at uh, what it really means, like look at, you know, what languages exist in these classes and how many speakers and what percentage of the languages of the world um, um, belong in these classes, then, uh, you know, things become a little more uh, drastic. So, you know, if you look at class zero, 1.2 billion speakers speak these languages, um, which are not even looked at and have very almost zero resources available and they account for 88.38 percent of uh, the total languages of the world and at, on the other hand in class five the winners they're actually only seven languages right and they they are just 0.28 percent of the total languages of the world now what does this mean what what uh, happens when there's this kind of uh, disparity um, is that not only um, do the people of these languages have absolutely no access to language technology uh, in their own languages and therefore no access to you know a lot of um, information services entertainment services uh, all kinds of um, other kind of support services in their own languages education in their own languages uh, but slowly it causes these languages to kind of die out right um, people kind of then move towards whichever is the dominant language and their own language um, dies out. So, uh, you know, there are very serious repercussions for this kind of disparity that we see um, between languages of the world. Now, 
the other thing that we did was from a typological uh, uh, point of view. So this is the question about do NLP features have sufficient uh, representation? Uh, do um, uh, do NLP systems have sufficient uh, representation of typological uh, features from across the world of um, uh, across the languages of the world? So um, based on this walls database, which is like a um, uh, linguistic uh, feature representation, uh, typological representation um, database, uh, which has 192 uh, features, and each feature contains a number of unique categories. Uh, we divided, um, you know, we kind of uh, looked at uh, the categories in languages 0, 1, 2, but, but not 3, 4, 5, um, as the ignored categories of features. And then we looked at these typological features with most ignored versus uh, the least ignored um categories so based on this kind of a thing the what we found was that um there are a number of features which are completely ignored uh, by mm, uh, nlp um, systems right so one of them is this uh, you know one of the least ignored uh, features in, in this um, analysis was 144e right and this feature is actually uh, represented by a number of languages spread across the world. So it's not as if it's like focused on a particular area or a particular language. And it's only that language that has this feature and just got missed out. Um, it's actually present across uh, a number of languages. And um, um, so if anyone's interested, this feature basically deals with, uh, you know, the placement of negative uh, morphemes in, um, in, in a specific kind of subject, verb, object, uh, word order um, in the language, right? So this has a lot of repercussions. So, uh, you know, we also looked at uh, earlier work by um, uh, Ateje and um, Schwenk, 2019 work, in which they also um, classified uh, languages and speakers based on the ignored uh, languages. So if you look at this, um, you know, if Americ has nine ignored features, you know, it's a class two language which has nine ignored features, which is a lot of features have been ignored in it. You find that the error rate is actually quite high for the languages for which the number of features that are ignored are high. So you know, it actually um, has repercussions on uh, the system accuracies for these languages, even if they are multilingual systems, because they, they haven't seen these features at all. They haven't seen um, um, uh, enough of these languages, right? And another interesting point is that, you know, there, there's this whole thing of like, you know, if you have one member of a language family, then it will probably uh, be able to compensate for not ha looking at other language families. And, um, you know, this uh, data uh, shows something quite different. So uh, Amharic and Arabic are the two most commonly spoken languages of the Semitic family now. Um, Arabic is a highly resourced language uh, with zero ignored features, and uh, the error rates uh, for their systems are 7.8, whereas Amharic has nine ignored features, and the error rate is 60.71. So, um, you know, the kind of repercussions that we have uh, by ignoring these um, are pretty far reaching in terms of, um, you know, whether those systems actually work for these languages or not. So, the next thing we looked at is, um, you know, the relationship between the languages uh, represented in NLP and um, the conferences uh, to say how inclusive the conferences are. And why would we do that? You know, why are we interested in like holding conferences responsible? Like, why don't you have these languages represented? Or, you know, do you have um, these languages represented? Because a lot of um, language technology that's uh, available is driven by NLP research. So, you know, the resources that are available uh, kind of drive what um, research happens. and you know, again, what research happens drives what resources are available. So it's like a, a cycle that is very, very productive for um, the top languages because they, they, the resources are available. People focus more on those, um, you know, building those technologies and doing research in those languages. More resources get built and, you know, they generally uh, benefit from that. But it 
is extremely detrimental to the low resource languages or languages that are in the um, uh, you know the lower end of the uh, spectrum uh, because there are no resources available people don't bother to look at uh, doing research on those languages and it just kind of mm, uh, perpetuates that vicious uh, circle so the languages that we have uh, kind of uh, the conferences that we have kind of looked at are the following um, you can see them so acl nacl amnlp esel uh, competition linguistic journal coling lrec and a number of workshop um, proceedings and uh, you know these are the common places where people publish uh, most of uh, nlp um, research now what have we um, done here so we wanted to understand how uh, multilinguality is changing as the conferences uh, are um, you know uh, going across um, time so you know with each iteration of a conference are they becoming more multilingual or not uh, becoming multilingual and uh, we kind of do this through uh, language mentions in papers as a me measure of language inclusion. So for example, if say you say look at ACL 2019 and you pick up a paper from ACL 2019 and you say th that it mentions English, German and Spanish, then it has three language mentions and we kind of you know use that as um, a measure. And then we um, use entropy to um, get a single number uh, measure for uh, the you know the skew in this language distribution for uh, um, uh, conference iteration so basically what we're doing is that instead of just using frequency metrics we use entropy um, and we kind of um, you know sum all the language mentions across all papers which gives us the language distribution and then we normalize it and we calculate the uh, entropy so basically higher the entropy um, more diverse is the language distribution for that uh, particular conference. And the other interesting thing is that, um, you know, if you um, uh, uh, raise entropy to the power two, then that also gives you a measure of the average number of language mentions in a particular year, uh, in a particular conference. So for example, ACL 2019 has an entropy of 4.1. So and if you look at this, um, you, if you plot this uh, over um, time, since ACL has been in existence, you'll find that the entropy has kind of increased. And what this really means is that uh, in the beginning, the average number of language mentions for um, ACL uh, was just four. And now it's around 16 languages. So there has been kind of uh, an increase in um, uh, language mentions and hence lang language inclusion uh, over time. Um, we we'll did this for all the conferences that um, I had mentioned earlier. And uh, we found some very interesting um, results from here. So if if you can see, you can, um, you know, if you look at um, these graphs, you will find that certain conferences are much more inclusive overall than certain other conferences. So if you look at LREC, which is um, which uh, which is the language resources and evaluation conference, and it is really focused on multilingualism and um, you know um, uh, multilingual systems and resources, etc. And this right from the beginning has been uh, a pretty inclusive lang um, conference. Um, as far as uh, number of languages included are concerned. And similarly, if you look at the workshops, you find that workshops have also started being extremely um, inclusive. So, and you know, some, some of the other uh, venues are much less, continue to be much less inclusive. The other thing that we found very interesting was that around 2015, there was a spike in um, this language inclusion. And we think this is because of the, um, you know, coming of the deep learning systems around that time. Uh, and, you know, how um, people started looking at universal systems and multilingual systems, uh, universal models and multilingual models uh, for these um, massive mm, systems. And um, uh, so uh, this led to kind of more languages being mentioned and more languages being included in these um, systems. The other interesting thing here is that the later a conference um, um, started, the more inclusive 
it has been so you know make what you will of it like um, you know uh, some of the older conferences continue to or venues continue to be uh, a little bit less inclusive than some of the uh, newer ones so we also kind of try to see what the standing of each language uh, class uh, based on typology uh, class wise language representation is uh, in um, the languages and we found that um, from the ta taxonomic uh, perspective you know um, how much um, so this is basically we, we've calculated the mean um, reciprocal rank uh, for um, each of the languages belonging in a particular class for a particular conference. So how much uh, representative of each class is a particular language, right? And if you look at that, um, these are the inverse uh, MRR scores for the various conferences and across various classes. Um, again, um, you know, so the lower the score, um, higher the representation of that particular class. Again, we find that overall, LREC and the workshops continue to be uh, overall more uh, inclusive and more representative um, of all the classes in um, uh, of languages that uh, based on typology. OK, so now what? So what the previous two things I hope has kind of shown you is that you know this is not a very straightforward things that um, there is a lot of variance and there's a lot of um, there are a lot of subtle nuances uh, in the way this whole uh, acceptance of different languages across different NLP conferences work and somehow you know just doing some basics the um, or some you know uh, straightforward uh, statistical analysis doesn't capture these um, you know, much more complex interactions that are happening between various things here, right? And uh, they don't capture the um, the subtle nuances in the data that uh, are affecting the results. So, and of course, we know that embeddings can uh, show, um, uh, uh, embeddings can capture the complex relationships uh, from the data without supervision uh, in a much more effective way. So what, um, we have kind of done then is like we have um, looked at uh, how we can embed heterogeneous entities, uh, which is like the authors, the languages, the conferences, etc. How we can like, kind of project them into the same space based on the papers associated with them and try to see um, um, what the distance between um, you know similar word distributions and the conferences uh, associated with them are you know so that gives us a better um uh, representation and understanding of um how all all these uh, complex um, relationships between languages and authors um and conferences uh, can be um, understood or interpreted over time so based on that um, those embeddings um, you know this what you are seeing here is like a um, two-dimensional Disney plot of uh, the um, embeddings that we had the heterogeneous entity embeddings that we had and um, based on that if we saw that for example ACL over time has uh, kind of um, gone from um, being associated with very few languages so this we plotted only for class uh, classes one to five um, and not for class six which is like well represented in any case um, so ACL has become um, much better over time but it still remains pretty far off from um, uh, sorry, uh, these class one and two uh, um, languages, right? So this is basically there's a long distance relationship between ACL always and these um, languages, which have um, much lesser resources or are, uh, you know uh, fall under our uh, typological category zero, uh, uh, one, two, and three. Uh, computational linguistics remains on this edge all the time so which also basically shows that you know uh, acl has also become much more data driven over time um, whereas cl remains uh, uh, in that space what is much more interesting is that lrec is firmly in the middle it's 
right there in the center um, being uh, much more accessible uh, to all the languages and so have the workshops so they the workshops and the you know all the different classes and lrec seem to be kind of um, friends they're friends of each other so um, if you we also kind of try to uh, look at the mrr for different um, language categories 0 to 5 to see this this is this is mainly to signify how many authors in that research community are closely uh, working on this languages right uh, on these languages so what we found here was that um, even for 0 and 1 uh, for 0 we found like a very high mrr score and what this really means is that there are specific researcher communities or there are specific um, uh, groups who are focusing on these languages which are um, you know um, in that uh, uh, ignored categories right uh, whereas um, the higher resource languages like you know the languages that go into five four etc um, overall everybody works on it there isn't like a um, group that um, works in it and you know uh, not all superheroes wear capes some of them actually work on uh, um, languages and problems that uh, no one is um, looking into so that's um, uh, another interesting um, finding of our thing now um, to end it all um, what were our takeaways and what does it all mean Firstly, from the taxonomy, it's really evident that there's this disparity between languages and the resources, right? Like that's that's really clearly there for everyone to see. Um, and then the typological considerations uh, point to the fact that you know the the in this race for SOTA, we are kind of um, forgetting that. Um, uh, to see whether uh, all the uh, typological features are present or not present in the language. It's very unclear at the moment whether uh, these systems would work for these languages or would not work for these languages because, you know, some they haven't really been trained or they haven't even really been um, tested on um, some of these features. Um, the conferences are getting more and more inclusive. There's a lot of work to be done and it is really um, um, Though, you know, over time, uh, conferences are much more inclusive. I think ACL uh, is still not as inclusive as it can be, um, you know, to the work done on different languages. And of course, that they are focused communities and they are the ones who are basically, uh, you know, focused NLP communities, which are uh, responsible for kind of um, probably saving the languages from uh, extinction um, as far as technological uh, uh, impact is concerned. Um, Anika, if you could wrap up. You know, sorry, sorry. if you could wrap up, then we have a few questions to take. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So, oh, I took so long. I didn't realize. There's no timer here. So I could have hurried up. Yeah. No, okay, thank you. I mean, Kalika, this was an excellent talk. I mean, it's such a such an interesting topic, and I personally know that how passionate you have been about this for many years. Uh, so, uh, so we have a few questions. So let's see how much we can cover. So, first, one question is that: so, what do you think in your conference analysis? What is the influence of working language of the conference, which is most often being English, uh, and and what is the influence of that in your conference analysis? So we haven't actually looked at uh, um, because all these conferences that we looked at are the uh, popular venues where um, NLP work is published, and uh, they're all uh, all in English. English yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, the next question is: Can you tell me more on the cycle between application driving research and research further developing applications? which leads to focus on statistical signals and capturing data rather than resource development, which is expensive affecting low resource focus. Okay, I um, so this paper, we haven't done that. We haven't looked at the application thing because uh, you know, that that's 
there that's a little bit difficult to get that data like how the, how many number of applications are present in a particular language etc cetera, etc cetera. and what do you count as an application uh, you know does an interface in a language count as an application um, etc so or is machine translation a downstream application so does that count and is that a system so so there are difficulties there but um, uh, i think even there uh, it is um, um, a very strange cycle from my experience and this is not like data driven uh, quantitatively supported fact but from my experience uh, most of uh, language technology uh, comes from it's top down it's from oh we have the system we know how to build this uh -huh. and now let's go find the application for this and very little of it i'm not saying none there's lots of people who work in the opposite direction but very little of it comes from here is a community or here are uh, the uh, you know the, the demography that needs these things and now they need language technology for to fulfill their needs and we go backwards so very little work unfortunately is done in the other thing and i think if we focused more on that we probably would also create more resources and more technologies in the absolutely, absolutely. no makes sense uh, one last quick question there are a couple of questions related question how do we identify the features we missed in a developed system or how do you find which features get ignored for a language if you could quickly respond to that yeah so so we use the walls database it's there it's um, you know uh, uh, publicly uh, available so if you can go look at it um, the walls database uh, classifies all the typological features with languages so if a particular uh, language has um, uh, if a particular system has a particular language then we assume that all those typological features are um, um, okay. you know in that thing yeah got it no thank you kalika again uh, there are a few more questions if you have the time if you could just look at the q and a sure, sure. and I'll, I'll do that i'll do that and the other thing is that the, you know all this work and all the data etc is available uh, and people can go and check it out yeah maybe if you could put to post the link on the q and a tab or the thank chat channel that would be helpful yeah. thank, thank you kalika. thanks bye thank you kalika uh, everyone we'll be back in the session in about a minute now thank you